Now, if we go right into the book of Micah, Micah the prophet, I could say my son, Micah. <laughs> His name means, who is like God? Who is like God? Micah. So every time someone calls his name, they, re, they are saying, who is like God? Oh, here comes who is like God, whenever they call his name. You see, Micah's message, I find it so interesting, that his message is really a question to the people of Judah and Israel. He was going around really searching to see if there's anyone like God. Is there anyone that's godly? In Israel, in Judah. Look at verse 1 of Micah chapter 1. The word of the Lord that came to Micah of Moresheth in the days of Jotham, Ahaz, and Jezekiah, excuse me, Hezekiah, the king of Judah, which he saw concerning Samaria and Jerusalem. So again, Micah wrote what he saw prophetically concerning the northern kingdom of Israel, which its capital is Samaria, and the southern kingdom, Judah, which its capital is Jerusalem. And so he's writing, uh, you know, the fall, you know, concerning the fall of Samaria, of Israel, the northern kingdoms, and the fall or the destruction of Jerusalem the southern kingdoms. You can look through verses 6 through 12, or actually through 16, for uh, his prophecy against them. Now, it's interesting in verse 10, and all the way through 16, really, uh, he uses puns to, uh, or a play of words to describe the common judgments on the cities around Judah. For example, well, we know that names have meanings. And he shows their names, how their names are tied to their destiny. You know, so look at verse 10. You will see that he named this one of the cities around Judah, the city of Gath. And the name Gath means to tell. It means tell. And there he said, tell it to Gath, or tell it not to Gath, meaning, well, if you were to take it, as Gath means, it will be like saying, tell it not to tell. Tell it not to tellville, like Jacksonville, you know. D don't tell them. They need me to tell, but don't tell them about the destruction that's to come. And we see Beth Arpa, which means the house of dust. And he says, go roll in the dust. So he's calling out judgment on these several cities, and he's using their name, uh, to call down judgment or say what their destiny will be. Now, going into chapter 2, he comes now with some warnings. Warnings, actually, this warning is to Micah. And so, when Micah starts to prophesy and say, this is what's going to happen, of course, like the other prophets, they told Micah to stop prophesying those hateful things. Those evil things, those wicked things. Stop saying that in verse 6 of chapter 2, it says, Do not prattle, you say to those who prophesy, so they shall not prophesy to you, they shall not return insult for insult. So people were saying, not only to Micah, but the other prophets, you know, stop prophesying. Stop saying these things. We don't want to hear them. Stop, so, stop being so judgmental. Stop being so negative. And those things, they would say, will never happen as you prophesy. You know, there's nothing new under the sun because I find today the very thing, the very things that, that Micah was dealing with and the other prophets, as people say, stop being so negative. It's the same things that we see today. Pastors that will say, you know what, we're going to read God's word. We're going to look at prophecy and say of what's, co what's coming and warning people that get right with the Lord because judgment is coming. People say, oh, you're so judgmental. You're so legalistic. You know, how can we as watchmen see the things that are coming prophetically from God's word 
And, and all we want to do, all people want to do, pastors today, is tickle people's ears and say, you got a champion in you. Oh, God loves you the way that you are. And, 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 and not to warn people about the judgment to come. So people were saying, stop being negative. And look at Micah's response in verse 7. He says, you who are named the house of Jacob... Is the spirit of the Lord restricted? Are these his doings? Do not my peep, excuse me, do not my words do good to him who walks uprightly? In other words, he's saying that we're prophesying judgment, but if you are right with God, you have nothing to worry about. If you're not right with God, well, you should be concerned. These prophecies are against you. And so Micah says in verse 11 that they want a prophet that will tell them the good things about themselves. But in verse 3, chapter 3 now, Micah's dealing with the wicked rulers and prophets. In chapter 3, verse 1, and he's, I said, Hear now, O heads of Jacob, and you rulers of the house of Israel, is it not for you to know justice? In other words, instead of doing good, these rulers, these civil uh, leaders, these uh, um, uh, prophets and, and preachers, instead of doing good, they're doing evil. They're ripping people off. They are taking advantage of the poor. And so God is, is through the prophet saying, you know, aren't you supposed to be acting justly and doing justice? And then in verse 4, it says they run to God to help them in their times of trouble. In other words, and we have seen this with the other prophets, they're doing evil seven days a week. They show up on church or on Sabbath and they offer sacrifice and say, God help us, we're in trouble and of course, God is saying, I'm not hearing it. I'm not hearing you because you're taking me for some kind of, uh, you know, genie in a bottle that you're only coming to me when you're in trouble and you need a couple of wishes. And so in verses 7 through, excuse me, verses 5 through 7, Micah says God will punish them. Uh, he will punish the false prophets for their lies now, going into chapter 4, we see this is a glorious chapter. It gives the future glory of Jerusalem. You see, whenever there's a prophecy that's given to any city, God tells of the destruction, but he also talks about the restoration and the glory that's to come if there's repentance. Now, in chapter 4, verses 1 and 2, he says, Now it shall come to pass in the latter days. What is the latter days? I believe we are in the latter days. Uh, that the mountains of the Lord's house shall be established on the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and people shall flo follow, excuse me, flow to it. Many nations shall come and say, come and let us go up to the mountains of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways and he will... He shall walk, we shall walk in his paths. For out of Zion the law shall go forth, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. So Jerusalem, as it says, will one day be the center of worship. That all of the nations of the world, from every tongue, every tribe, every nation, will, will flow to Jerusalem to worship. Listen, not a temple. Not a cow, not a man, but Jesus himself. Because the prophecies tell us that Jesus will one day return to Jerusalem, and there he will set up his kingdom, and there well, it will have true worship, where we worship our king, our God and our king. And so we see in this prophecy that, that one day Jerusalem will be restored, where worship will be restored there. But not only worship, but listen, it will be a time of peace when Jesus returns. In verse 3, it says, 
He shall judge between many peoples and rebuke strong nations afar off. They shall beat their sword into plowshares and their spears into prune, pruning hooks. Nations shall lift up, excuse me, not lift up sword against nations, neither shall they learn war anymore. Now, it's interesting in this prophecy here that uh, Micah is looking into the future and he's seeing there's a time where instead of making, taking metal and sword and, and, and instead of making, uh, you know, military missiles and, and bombs and all these weapons, that the, the material will be used instead to make, well, farming materials, you know. Uh, it, it won't be a time for war. There won't, there won't be any war. So why do you need a sword? Why do you need weapons? And so they'll beat their metal into tools instead of war, uh, um, you know, missiles or whatever. It's interesting, and I think if I remember right, this same prophecy, this imagery of a man taking a, a, a sword and pounding it and beating it into a tool... I believe they have a statue in front of the United Nations with this imagery here. So they're looking forward. Uh, I guess the United Nations is, is looking forward or trying to bring peace. But that peace will not come from man. It will be by the Lord Jesus Christ. And so that will be a, a glorious day. In verses 6 and 7, God, it says, will gather all of the sick and the, and, and, and the hurting and will give comfort and strength. So we... We can look forward to that because, again, you look at our world. Oh, people are sick, spiritually speaking. People are hurting. People are lost. People are confused. And as I mentioned before, suicide rates have gone through the roof. Uh, young people are living a life of, of purposelessness. They, they don't even know what their purpose in life is. And that's why they're out there rioting. They're trying to find purpose. You see... God is saying he's going to take all of those who are sick and hurting and comfort and strengthen them. In chapter 5, we see another glorious chapter, the coming Messiah. In chapter 5, verse 2, it says, But you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, though you are little among, among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me, listen, the one, capital O, to be ruler uh, in Israel, whose going forth are from old, from everlasting. You see, this is one of the amazing prophecies. Again, 700 plus years before Jesus even showed up, here Micah is prophesying that the ruler will be born in Bethlehem. Anyone know of any baby born in Bethlehem? Well, we only know of one. Well, actually, uh, uh, the, uh, the King David was, was one. Uh, but Jesus was that who Micah is prophesying would be born in Bethlehem. And it's like, what is Bethlehem? It's so, I mean, it's a, a shepherd's town. Nothing... Nothing is exciting about Bethlehem. <laughs> if God would choose anywhere to let Jesus be born, it should be in Jerusalem, they will say. But no, he brought him to a place, a little shepherd town, to be born there. Now, Israel, uh, I, I believe as he's saying here, this Jesus will will bring peace, he will bring safety, and he will bring power to this nation as he rules there. In chapter 5, excuse me, chapter 6, verse 3, we see that what God is requiring from us, from them, from us. In verse 3, it says, Oh, my people, what, shall, what have I done to you? And how have I worried you? Testify against me. You see, God is reminding them of the goodness He showed them. Think about over the centuries how God has blessed Israel, how He has blessed Judah. And He's asking, what have I done to you? 
What, what, what was wrong with how I treated you? Because as he blessed them, instead of re responding in love and adoration, they're turning his, their backs against him. So he then asked them in verses 6 and 7, what do you think he wants in return? Sacrifices? Burnt offerings? Uh, you, you want me, you, do you think I want you to sacrifice your children is what he's asking? But here's what God requires of them. Look at verse 8. He's requiring three things. Verse 8, it says, has, He has shown you, O man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you, but to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. If you think about all of the sacrifices that Israel brought, uh, the people brought to Jerusalem, all the animals they sacrificed, given to God, oh, this is going to please God, and, and, and what does God want? I mean, He required the sacrifices, but is that really what He wants? No, He wants, his, he wants their heart. He wants their heart. He wants a heart that will, look what He says, to do good. In other words, do justice, do, do good but also to love mercy. In other words, be good. So we are to do good, we are to be good, but also we are to walk humbly before God. Humbly, and notice it says, before God. In other words, everywhere we go, everywhere we walk, whether it's work or in your home, no matter where it is, we need to be humble before God. And humility and some people believe that humility is thinking less of yourself. It's not thinking less of yourself, but it's thinking uh, better of others. Think, thinking more of others. Thinking more of God. Putting others above yourself, as Philippians chapter 2 will say. And so, God is saying, these are, these are the things I want. If you want to please me, man, do good. Be good and walk humble before me. Now, in chapter 4... This is where Micah concludes. Again, he is, it, is, it reminds me so much of the book of Romans as Paul in the book of Romans would, would kind of put humanity on trial. And in chapter 3, he, he says, there's none righteous, no, not one. Right? We all are guilty. And this is what Micah has done as he looks through the land. And in verse 1 of chapter 7, he says, woe is me. For I am like those who gather summer fruits, like those who glean vintage grapes. There is no cluster to eat of the first ripe fruit which my soul desires. In other words, Micah is saying, you know, in those days they had farmers and they will have their grapes as they bring forth the harvest. And there will always be just, a, uh, you know, some, some grapes that are left over that you can go and glean from. And Micah is saying, I can't even find any grapes left over. There's none. And in other words, what, what he's really saying is as he has gone through Israel, he's looking for fruits. Isn't that what Jesus said? He's looking for fruit in our lives. What is the fruit that God is looking for, that Jesus is looking for? The fruit of love. The fruit of the Spirit. But yet, as Micah goes through, he can't find any. He's looking for godly people. He's looking for upright people. But he says, I, I find no fruit in the land, no goodness, no godliness. In verse 2, it says, the faithful man has perished from the earth. <laughs> there's no good. Every, I guess if there's anyone that was there, he probably died already because I didn't find him. And there is no one upright among men. They all lie in wait for blood. Every man hunts his brother with a net. So he searches the entire land. There's none righteous. There's none that's good. Instead, what he finds is that people are just looking for opportunity to do evil. In verse 3, that they may, uh, may successfully do evil with both hands. The prince, he's speaking of the... the, the, the uh, the rulers, you know, the kings, the governors of the land, the prince 
As for gifts, the judges seeks bribes, and the great man utters his evil desires, so they scheme together. So he's looking at the civil rulers, and again, they're looking for gifts. They're using their platform, their, their position to line their pockets with money and, and gifts. The judges, instead of ruling in justice, they're looking for bribes. People are going in through the back door and say, hey, if you let me go or let this situation go, here's a little tip for you, or a big tip. And he says, and the great man or the, the, the community leaders, listen, if you're in any position, whether you're a father or a boss or you are the head of your class, whatever it is, you are a leader and you are to walk rightly before the Lord. You are to do justice. And so he says in verse 4, the best of them is like briars. The most upright is sharper than a horned hedge. Uh, excuse me, a thorned hedge. You see, the most upright person will wound you like a thorn. I find this chapter so interesting because it doesn't matter where you look. If you put in hope and trust in man, it's just a matter of time before they disappoint you, before they poke you, before... They wound you. I mean, he goes so far to say in verse 5, do not trust in, in a friend. Do not put your confidence in a companion. Guard the doors of your mouth. In other words, don't say everything to everyone that surrounds you, even your closest friends, because they will betray you. From, uh, uh, do not uh, guard the doors of your mouth. And listen, from her who lies in your bosom, even from your wife. Don't even trust your wife. I don't trust her. I don't. And she don't trust me either. So we're even. Hmm. Where does the deepest wounds come from? Yeah, you better watch. I don't trust you too, Victor. <laughs> That's right. But where does the deepest wounds come from? A lot of times it's not from a stranger, it's a family, it's your friends, your closest ones, the people that are closest to you. And Mike is saying, don't trust them, don't trust anyone. Well, there have to be some kind of trust to have a relationship. But he's saying, basically, if you're putting your full trust in someone, you will be disappointed at some point. Not even the pastor or president or... Whoever it is, a parent. As a matter of fact, he even goes as far as to say it in verse, four, verse 6. For sons dishonors fathers. Daughters rise against her mother. Daughters-in-law against her mother-in-law. But well, we know that's automatic. <laughs> no, not in my, no, my, I have a good mother-in-law. I, I, I do have to say that. A man's enemies are the man of man's of his own household. So we see here that even in your family, you can be betrayed. Therefore, I will look to the Lord. Here's the answer. I will look to the Lord. I will wait for God of my salvation. My God will hear me. You see, there's one person that Micah trusts, and that's God. There's one person that he looks to and that's God because he searched the entire land and there he find that there's none like God. Who is like the Lord? Well, there's one that's to come. That, well, in, from Micah's perspective, he was going to be born in Bethlehem. And that's the only one that you can put your trust in. And we know that he will return once again and he will walk in justice and righteousness. He will bring peace. Amen? And so, Father, we thank you again for these wonderful prophets, Lord, these men that were bold in going out and preaching truth, even though, well, the truth hurts sometimes, but, Lord, in order for us to understand our condition, we have to know what is wrong. And these 
uh, men were faithful in obeying your word. Even, even Jonah in his rebellion turned and he did what was right. And so we thank you that we have examples of men who did what was right. And we, Lord, need to do what is right, what is right so that we can be blessed by you. So, Lord, we thank you for this lesson of mercy, uh, of, of justice. We thank you for the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. And we thank you, Lord, for all that you have done for us. Father, we pray that as we go our separate ways, Lord, that you will watch over us and keep us and bless us, Lord. Make your face shine upon us. Give us peace. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen.